Um, good evening and welcome to another Friends Forum. For those who have, who have not attended virtually before, I'm Louise Sue. I'm a retired Naval Captain and I am the Chair of the Friends of the Canadian War Museum. Um, before I get, we get started, please note that this event is being recorded and a link to it will be available in the coming days. The, the plan for this evening is that I'll introduce our speaker who will talk for about 45 minutes in, in order to leave some time for questions at the end. You will remain muted until then. And during the Q&A, we would ask that you use your raise the hand button and we will then endeavor to acknowledge you and that, so that you can ask your question. Um, now, before we get started, I would remind you that the Friends' primary mission is to support the War Museum, both uh, with funds and volunteers to help the museum meet their aims. As such, both your membership in the Friends or donations directly benefit the museum. I will now, now proceed um, to introduce our guest speaker this evening, Mr. John Goheen. Although we have provided a small overview of his accomplishments with our post regarding the event in preparation for this evening, I came across the narrative posted on the Governor General's Honours and Awards site regarding John's uh, receipt of the Sovereign's Medal for Volunteers. And so I'm going to read this to you as, as sort of our little additional introduction to John this evening. And it's a bit of a surprise to him because he didn't know I dug this out. Since 1996, John Goheen has been researching and relaying the stories of Canada's battlefront experience in Europe. He's been a guide for the Royal Canadian Legion's Pilgrimages of, of Remembrance, as well as a volunteer with the Port Moody Station Museum, where he constructs exhibits and provides free public le lectures to promote the commemoration of the First World War. So there's a little additional in uh, um, uh, little in in initiation to Mr. Goheen, and therefore, I now turn it over to you, sir, to please share your screen and away we go. Uh, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon for those out west here. Uh, good to see so many faces I remember from different pilgrimages that are joining us. And I'm, I'm, it's a thrill for me. I've been a friend of the Canadian War Museum since about 1988. So I am glad to uh, work with the group tonight. Uh, I live in the greater Vancouver area. So the commute's a bit of a beast. I don't get to the museum as often as I would like, but uh, it's good to be connected this way. Um, yeah, so tonight I wanted to share uh, what we've been doing for the last uh, almost three decades with a uh, pilgrimage of remembrance. And it's now the Legion National Foundation's pilgrimage of remembrance. But I should point out that people were have been touring the Western Front since uh, you know the guns literally were just fell silent and people were off to touring battlefields in 1919. Uh, they estimated about 60,000 people, in fact, that first uh, year after the war went over to the Western Front. And you can imagine uh, it was a mixed bag of uh, veterans and families and those wanting to see where loved ones, um, their final resting place or where their brother had fought and uh, a variety of reasons. Um, into the 20s, these became much more organized uh, groups. You had uh, different organizations that were bringing more and more people over the Western Front and a burgeoning tourist industry that uh, followed in the reconstruction areas of uh, Western Front in France and Belgium from the locals who were entertaining, uh, hosting and hotels and restaurants. Um, there were casual tourists, those that were curiosity seekers that were going to see what it was all about. And then there was others who identified themselves quite differently. And these, these were the people there that were there for a, a purpose um, and turned themselves as pilgrims or on a pilgrimage. Mark Conley, um, in his recent book, I don't know if everyone's seen this. I don't know, Mark. Well, you can't see it on there anyway. Uh, great book on looking at those early years, but he talks about the term pilgrimage and that it emerged from its religious roots and was increasingly being applied to these secular journeys that were deemed to share similar characteristics. When pilgrimage is used to describe those traveling to see war cemeteries, memorials, and other places of commemoration, the blurring between the religious and the secular is obvious. Essentially, those uh, travelers engaged in these more solemn and uh, sacred purposes saw themselves as quite distinct from uh, tourists uh, on a holiday. And their journeys had meaning, whether it was from putting flowers on graves 
or on the, so many of the newly designed Imperial War grave commission sites. Or in the case of Great War veterans, we're going back to see places where they had fought to old dugouts and uh, places where they um, spent a good portion of their youth and where they lost friends. And uh, that was an important part of these pilgrimages. I think what we're looking at today, you know, 110 years after the fact now with the Legion's Na Legion National Foundation's pilgrimage, we at least evoked, I think, the spirit of those earlier pilgrimage journeys. Because um, when we, we go to Europe, we're bringing Canadians from across the country. And today, uh, in 2024 or 23, our most recent pilgrimage, these are the children, grandchildren, and, and of course, great grandchildren of so many that went over, either during the Great War or in the Second World War. But they're there for far beyond, um, as, as far beyond the visitor or tourist, they're there for very uh, deep and personal reasons, although very different perhaps than from the veterans, of course, who, who first started going on these pilgrimages. But again, uh, whether someone lost someone immediately or it was a great grandfather that was killed in one of the two wars, uh, it's still a very meaningful and moving uh, thing for people to go and retrace these footsteps. Despite COVID, which was put a real crimp in our, our, our plans, we had to cancel the 2021 edition, but uh, we had great interest once these were renewed in 2023 and had a long wait list uh, for those that wanted to go and couldn't. So uh, things were looking very good for the pilgrimage. Um, today, the pilgrimage that we now offer, it's operated and funded by the Legion National Foundation. It wasn't always that way because the foundation is fairly new. It's open to anyone in Canada. I'll see that, here we go. Open to anyone across the country. Uh, people can pay to go on the pilgrimage. and. There is another category of participant or pil pilgrim, and these are uh, command pilgrims. And so in Canada, the Royal Canadian Legion operates uh, 10 different commands that uh, involve all 10 provinces and three territories. So everyone is represented. And in each command, uh, each year or each every other year that the pilgrimage goes, uh, uh, notices goes out to the 1,350 plus branches in our country and about a quarter of a million members who have an opportunity to apply. They are selected ultimately by their own provincial or area command. And these names are then sent on to the National Foundation who receives about 60 odd names. And from there, 10 are selected. And they're based on a, a criteria that's sent to all commands, all the uh, re Legion branches. Uh, obviously, you have to have a passport and be age of majority, so 19 and over. But they're also looking for people that are active in the Legion, uh, particularly those who have some connection with youth, uh, people that often go on our, our pilgrimages, uh, work with youth, either in cadet organizations, uh, teachers are often represented. But um, they want to see some sort of uh, ability to engage with youth. Uh, public speaking, again, uh, some engagement as a communicator uh, and putting to, together presentations because there is work to be done when people get back from the tour. As well, uh, each applicant uh, does an essay, about 500 words, uh, outlining why they would be the uh, best candidate to represent their command. And finally, uh, each person is uh, required to submit a post pilgrimage uh, presentation schedule. And these are, are if, if selected, these are a commitment to then go out into their communities and speak about uh, the things that they've experienced and, and learned while overseas. The program's evolved uh, quite drastically over the years that I've been involved almost 30 years now. Uh, the first pilgrimage we, we don't even actually know. Uh, uh, something about uh, in the Legion in the old days that uh, this is pre-computer and um, I'm sure there might be a dusty file somewhere, but we pretty certain that the first pilgrimage was in 1989. I do know that it was actually quite an informal affair. It was a group of veterans from the Second World War. 
that uh, under the Legion, um, all Legion members that went over to, to Europe, uh, they started in London and went over to Northwest Europe, France, Belgium, and Holland. Uh, they had no guide. They had just a group of veterans and they were, uh, other than a few wives, were largely uh, all male contingent. And um, typically no one was in charge. <laughs> so one of the veterans was a, an, a, an English, English fellow uh, named John Harrison. He had a, a knowledge of some of the greater, larger context, a historical context, and he sort of took over informal guiding duties. Um, that was the very first pilgrimage. The connection with youth and bringing over command reps happened in the aftermath. When they got back, they looked to expand this program and the idea that youth should be going on these tours and learning about um, what's over there and what Canada had uh, sacrificed in the last century. And so what was born was the Royal Canadian Legion Youth Pilgrimage uh, Youth, Pil Youth Leaders Pilgrimage of Remembrance, quite a mouthful. It was designed to take um, people between 19, age of majority, and 40. And those were the command pilgrims, as well as paying passengers, and then, um, and then take them over. It was an annual event, would go every July. And this continued on every year uh, in the, into the early 90s. Uh, it was taken over more formally by actually a former, now deceased, um, friend of the Canadian War Museum, uh, John Robbie Robertson. He was an ex-RCR, and I know he was one of your uh, volunteer guides there for a number of years. Uh, he took it over for a few years, and then I eventually got involved in uh, 1995 when I was a, a representative for British Columbia, and then in 1996, I was um, asked if I would like to take over the role as guide and historian for the pilgrimage, and I've been doing that ever since. And there's been some changes over the years. We go every two years now. Uh, costs, are, you can imagine, are quite significant. So we go every two years. We've had uh, all sorts of adversity. We had one year, I think it was 99, there was an airline strike that we literally uh, averted at the 11th hour. Uh, in fact, it was already the day of the travel departure in Newfoundland when the uh, Air Canada settled their strike. We had IRA bomb scares in London. The day of the London 2 bombing, we arrived that morning uh, to absolute chaos, uh, foot and mouth disease uh, one year, which restricted uh, um, entry into some of the uh, cemeteries and put fish on the menu just about every single night of the tour, which was not overly popular after about day seven. Um, so yeah, there's been all sorts of things that we've uh, faced over the years, but uh, we've carried on and... Um, uh, the show always did go on. We've never missed a year until COVID. What we look at with the tour, um, and again, every there's some there's many commercial tours out there, but what I think sets ours apart is we've got the luxury of time. Our our tours are 15 days, and of course there's travel, and you're going going from Canada to we arrived to Paris. Now we go in and out of Paris. But there's 12 full days on the ground and our days are full. They start from uh, 7.30 in the morning. And I know there's many 2023 and previous pilgrims uh, in the audience uh, can attest that we do leave early and uh, usually end up around 4, 4.30 in the afternoon. But essentially we use these four main towns or cities as our bases from which we then go out and um, explore certain aspects. And I call them gateways because um, the idea being that you, you know you can't you can't cover everything. And the tour that I or the pilgrimage program that I inherited in the late nineties um, was kind of like butter on toast, uh, hot toast, and it was spread pretty thinly. And it wasn't to say that there was a, a it was a poor tour, but it was too much. And I know some of our past participants might be chuckling to think that uh, anything could have been more grueling than more recent tours, but um, it was going from London to up into Northern Holland and back to London again, all in, uh, all in 14 days. And you saw a lot of sights, but you didn't see much in any sort of depth. 
And so I kind of likened it to more like a camera lens that can zoom in and out of different things. And so while you can't cover everything in two world wars in 12 days, you can cover some things fairly deeply, but you can't, uh, you have to arrange it as such as that you're coming in and out of different events. And so sometimes the chronology is not always there. We start uh, in Normandy and lower Normandy around in Bayou now, it used to be calm, but uh, and look at what happened sort of from June 6 on to the, in the Overlord operation to late August, 1944. And again, that is an, an immense operation. You can't cover everything, but we cover some things quite, quite deeply. And the idea being that these gateways are, are designed so that participants can experience certain aspects and find meaning in them versus trying to see uh, dozens and dozens of aspects and, and not really get uh, the full significance. And so part of that lends to the purpose of, of the pilgrimage and it's to provoke uh, memories and feelings that uh, while participants are there that they'll take away and go back to Canada and remember not just things they saw, but how they were feeling when they're on these sites. And again, use that in, in, in their discussions and presentations that they're expected to do when they get back to Canada. Um, we, one of the challenges I had is like, what do you include in a tour and what do you exclude? And it, uh, it was in the early 2000s, I remember approaching uh, Dominion Command at the time, who was jurisdiction for the pilgrimage. And there's this whole idea of coverage. And, and so what do you go see? We, our challenge then is that we were going up into Northern Holland, incredibly significant for Canada, but also incredibly grueling for the participants. And by the end of the tour, um, people were really getting tired. And this was a, a, a carryover to previous the previous uh, itineraries that we had inherited. And so we had to look at, um, you know, where do you go? And uh, you can't see everything. So less is more, what does that mean? And so I compiled a list of all the significant sites of meaning that we do visit and all the significant sites that we don't visit. And it was sort of like, have a look at these two lists. Any side, any any list, any item on either side of that ledger is incredibly significant and important to Canada. And so one is not more important than the other, but you have to at some point draw the line and make some decisions. And so that's where we started to go deeper instead of the breadth and trying to cover so much. And I think it's made for a much more uh, meaningful and poignant uh, experience. But uh, in the time that we do have, in the places we do go, uh, we go, obviously, there's going to be sites that you have to go to. Uh, you're always going to go to some of the big sites, like Vimy is going to be on there in the mon monument at Hill 145. But if you look at the pictures that we have here, um, that middle one, for example, it's the middle of a, a farmer's field. And there's nothing there to indicate anything happened there. But in fact, just to the into the fields behind the, the people you see, there was, a, for example, as a terrible atrocity, it was uh, 40 Canadian POWs uh, being escorted by the 12th SS uh, in the aftermath of the fighting in June 7th around uh, Puto, or June 8th, I should say, 1944 on Puto. And 35 of them were, were murdered in cold blood in that field. There's not a single thing to designate that site. There's no marker, there's nothing to commemorate it, but it's incredibly important. And in its, um, it's almost forgottenness, it, it, it's, it's quite uh, even more meaningful. And so we go to some of these places as well and make sure that people see um, not just the, the main things, but some of, the, some of these little, little um, out of the way places. Little cemetery you see on the right of the screen. That's um, just in the, during the hundred days, um, and that one is just a little tiny battlefield cemetery, rarely visited. Uh, Sun Quarry Cemetery, and uh, again, it's not the scale of something like Tynecott, but it's um, just in its little 
little silence. It's uh, so important. Um, so we make sure that we have a good mix of the uh, sites that are on and off the beaten, beaten track. We, um, in the itinerary that again, we break it down into those sort of four main areas uh, that we use as bases, but um, the idea that we really go deeply into, for example, what happened on June 6th, not just at the beaches, but we go inland, you know, places like Tyville, for example, and just see what was happening in the afternoon of June 6th. And again, it kind of like camera lens zooming in on, on some, very small unit actions in the case of Tyville was the North Shore Regiment, but just looking to see how that, uh, what happened, but then how that was sort of a, an example of what other Canadian units were facing in the aftermath of the invasion. But uh, in the coming days, then we look at other aspects of the, the days after the immediate invasion, um, especially as the Canadians were holding, uh, holding the German Panzer counterattack, and we're preparing for that around Puto and Brettville. And so with that as well as the atrocities that I mentioned uh, earlier too with the 12th SS. And you know, it's forgotten, but uh, with the casualties in the first six days of the Normandy campaign, 20% of those were murders by the uh, SS. And so we do have a good look at uh, where some of those things happen. Again, at places that are well known, the Chateau, um, or the Abbey d'Ardenne, the Chateau d'Audru, but again, in that field as well, uh, and other sites that are, are less less known. From there, we go on to Dieppe. We spend two days uh, and two nights in Dieppe, and again, we look at uh, uh, the different Canadian landing areas. Dieppe's an amazing place because it hasn't changed a whole lot in the 80 plus uh, years that uh, the uh, engagement happened, the raid on the 19th of August in 42. And it's one of those places that uh, war came on a single day and then the war left and really not much uh, else happened. And it's like a little slice out of uh, time. And you go to the, uh, you can see how that battle unfolded and what they were up against. From there, we move uh, north into Belgium and to Ypres. We do spend one more day looking at the Second World War with some of the South Scheldt uh, campaign operation switch back on the Leopold Canal and in, in behind at the Brackman Inlet. So we have a look at uh, what happened there, but we don't get to go farther north into Holland uh, in this during these uh, current pilgrimages. But that, uh, all those sites though, they're all carefully selected from the Second World War um, really really, I think, do give people an opportunity to engage with uh, what Canadians were up against uh, in 1944 and 45. Uh, from there, we switched gears and then uh, look at uh, the Canadians in the Great War. So Eep being where the baptism of fire in April 1915, and even earlier, the Princess Patricias who arrived there in January 1915, we, we go see where their first trench site was. And, um, see where, where Canada started the war and uh, the first casualties occurred. Sadly, they won't be the last, but uh, we, we do spend a good deal of time, four nights in Belgium. So we look at uh, what happened in 1915 and then again in 16, places like saint Eloi, Hill 62. And then the last uh, day of the Great War in Eat area, we look at uh, what happened with the Third Battle Eat and particularly for Canadians, uh, Ashendale. And so, um, it is a change, a change of pace and a change of gears. We start with the Second World War uh, with the idea that people possibly have a greater connection to that war just because through family, uh, family members or with media, and then shift gears into the first war for the second half of the pilgrimage. We go on to look at uh, uh, stay in Arras and then look at, uh, we use that as a base for the Psalm in 1916. Uh, look at what the Newfoundlanders did in the first day of the battle, and then later on in um, uh, in the Somme campaign, and then the Canadians, of course, who came in in early September 1915 and lost 24,000 casualties. And again, 
sometimes almost forgotten today, but when you think about the Vimy Memorial and the 10,000 plus names on there, 40% of those are from the Psalm in 1916. And yet uh, that battle gets very little, um, very little recognition anymore. So we make sure that we, we get to see that. And then uh, we shift gears in time, look at 1918 with a portion of the 100 Days campaign east of Arras along from uh, uh, Arras all the way to uh, Canal du Nord and into Cambrai. And again, we don't get to see all the sites for the 100 Days. We don't go down to Amiens on the current uh, uh, edition of the tour. But again, we get enough of what the 100 Days was about and see enough sites that I think people can start connecting and relating. We saved Vimy for the last day. Uh, it's the one that I think people are most excited or often are most excited to see. Uh, it's the end of a long tour. People are tired and Vimy provides a, a real spark for the last day. So chronologically, it doesn't fit, but it does emotionally. And we don't just go the main sites where 90% of the people go to see Hill 145. We go off, off the uh, park site and go see other parts of Vimy Battlefield to try to get, try to get a, a better uh, context. I think um, one of the challenges for remembrance, you got to remember when I started taking uh, people over, most of our participants were Second World War veterans. These are guys that actually had been there in the Second War and were going to sites where they had fought. So it was familiar territory to them. But increasingly over time, again, it's almost 30 years since I started uh, working my association with the pilgrimage, people don't have memory of the war. The last veteran I think that we had on our tour was in 2009. So those days are done. And so asking people to remember things they never experienced is kind of an impossible task. And so kind of approaches this idea of what we call informed memory and to give information and experiences and meaning that can help when they go back to explain at least uh, why something is meaningful to them. So you can't experience it. You can't recreate the experiences. And thanks goodness we, we don't have to go through that. But that, that's what we, we try to do. And the passage of time makes that harder and harder. Um, again, when I started, I was 29 years old uh, as a guide. And I felt quite, well, ridiculous, actually. What, that, what on earth am I going to tell a bunch of Second World War veterans when we went to these places? But one old vet, um, he was great. He told me, he took me aside and said, look, John, my war was 10, 10 feet on either side of my head. I have no idea what went on down that beach or across the field. And so he said, just keep doing what you're doing. Uh, it was an interesting insight because, again, their war was very much uh, where just where they were. And, um, and these guys were incredible with their stories and reminiscences reminiscences but um, you know that's lost now and so what we've lost we've also gained with a, a new generations of of pilgrims who bring different types of enthusiasm and connection to the pilgrimage the um, you can see in the picture below the ages we've got a broad range but there's a lot of younger people on there and what they're doing in that particular picture is listening to one of the command pilgrimage pilgrims uh, giving a presentation and so not dissimilar to many educational tours but we have uh, our command pilgrims do some homework before they go they're assigned a name of a great war soldier um, who they don't have any connection to other than it's from their command uh, their area and they're given some tools to research and when we get on site, we've all been together for a week and people are more comfortable with one another. They introduce the soldier to all the people on the pilgrimage. And it's, I think, for many, I think it's one of the highlights for me, it certainly is watching people make this connection. And I know talking to past pilgrims uh, who even 10 years on have 
said they, they connected to that soldier that they feel like is almost uh, part of their own family. Uh, and there's real power in, in bringing to words and to, to mind perhaps names and stories that have never been uttered for over a hundred years. That's the reason why we use the first war um, headstones um, just because of the likely disconnect uh, generationally. We want them to be removed and, and, and in researching them, people make that connection and realize despite the passage of a hundred plus years that uh, these are still people and still very close to us. Um, that particular one's in Tynecott, you can see in, in Belgium, but um, we do them uh, at, uh, all throughout the second half of the tour at different cemeteries, large and small. Other things we do to connect uh, to connect people to uh, to the um, what had gone before, we participate in ceremonies. You can see in the top left, that happens to be at uh, Benny Surmer in Normandy, but uh, we conduct formal ceremonies and sometimes the public's there and they will join in as well, uh, just cemetery visits. And these can be incredibly poignant. Sometimes we point out particular graves to make connections and uh, people always have time to wander and uh, just make their own connections and discover things. We're always mindful. Um, well, I, I think one of the things, for example, too, I should say the ceremonies, you see the top left is formal. We also do informal ones. And sometimes I think these even have more power. We do one in the uh, the Chateau d'Audru is a beautiful um, villa in uh, France, luxury hotel now. And sadly though, it's also a place of ter terror in 1944, Canadian prisoners, again, from the Puto battle were esco escorted there and um, interrogated. And we, we tell, we walk, we, we trace their footsteps, literally. We walk the ground where they were initially led in groups of three into the into a beautiful forest. But for Canadians, it's a very dark site because they were executed. And uh, we go to the site where the first three were executed and, and lay a wreath and have a moment of silence. And that simple act is incredibly touching. I think, I think for many, it's uh, probably more poignant than the formal ceremonies. We've done that too. We do for informal ones at Dieppe, uh, out at sea for the Navy, uh, things like that as well. So different ways to connect people. And, and you never know. The one thing I, I love is being in this role is I get to watch people make these connections. They don't know where they're going to happen because they're coming to new experiences. But somewhere along the way, people will have those uh, moments where it just, just, I think the sheer magnitude of what you're watching and seeing and experiencing just grip you. Just talking about it now, I I, I can feel it. it uh, it's pretty raw. It, and, and if you've if you've never been over there, um, it's hard to put into words how how being in the in their footsteps, literally, how that um, how that could be so incredibly meaningful and moving. And again, you don't ever forget how you feel. Uh, when you're when you get back, you might forget the details and what I was yammering on about, but uh, you don't forget how you feel. Always mindful that um, too, and very proud of the fact that the Royal Canadian Legion was involved in the first big Canadian pilgrimage back in 1936. I know many of you know about this. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but. Um, Back then, at the height of the Depression, 60 to 100 Canadians paid their way to go over to the unveiling of the Vimy Memorial. You can see them massing there, and they're not dissimilar to what we saw in 2017 when we had about 25,000 Canadians went back for the 100th anniversary of Vimy um, and a very different kind of uh, pilgrimage. But, um, you know, it's the, the Canadian Legion. Uh, that I, th I think we keep that in mind that they were the the first organization. Sadly, uh, pilgrimages kind of lost their way. We had interruption of the Second World War and kind of put a dent into returning to the battlefields. It kind of ended the great 
masses of Great War pilgrimages. And in the post Second World War world, uh, people wanted to move on. Um, what you see over there in Northwest Europe, really from Canada, you had regimental associations erecting monuments. Um, quite typically in the 1960s, you'll see them at Dieppe and around Normandy. Very um, modest monuments by today's standards, but very little going on. And uh, when I started getting involved with this pilgrimage, I, I rarely ever, well, I, I rarely ever saw any other groups touring around. There, there wasn't much going on in the uh, mid nineties, um, at least from Canada anyway, but that, that we'll talk about that in a, a minute, but uh, that landscape has certainly changed. And there's some more from uh, July, 1936. One of the things that I alluded to is uh, just the veterans who used to go on the trips, but uh, definitely a changing demographic that uh, over the years with those first veterans, I think more than half of the participants in the first couple of tours were veterans. And we would go to sites where they had fought and they were able to recount uh, stories and, and memories. Uh, sometimes you had to pull it out of them a little bit. Other changes is a guy on the left, um, I said, I've been doing this 30 years, and so that's about 12 years ago. Uh, I'm starting to become aware that um, I'm now becoming older and older on these tours, and uh, there's a lot of younger people coming, and it's great to see. But uh, when I started, I was in my late 20s. And you see, again, you can see the picture on the right, uh, some of the ages of people. And that's another change that we've had. Um, over the years, uh, most of the more commonly participants in the earlier days were male versus female, uh, older, despite the youth designation, those would be the younger people on the tour. They got rid of that in 2005 and it opened the doors and much broader range of participants and I think much better uh, getting diversity in, in the tour. But as times marched on and the last veterans, uh, uh, last veteran came on our tour, uh, again, younger and younger people going, now the grandchildren and great grandchildren um and often are not often uh, more women than men going um on tours which is good to see um so a real mix of of people obviously the landscape is changing as well uh obviously you know then and now shots are, are quite interesting especially when you're standing on a site but uh you know, if you look at uh, the picture on the left, that's the in Passchendaele area, you know, it's pretty hard to imagine what it was like. And, you know, we're 110 years on. The veterans from the Great War who started going back in the 20s used to complain that their battlefields are being ruined by reconstruction. And they would comment on how they would get annoyed that uh, what they remembered is rapidly disappearing. So here we are 110 years later. Um, it's a little more of a challenge, but, um, you know, oddly, in, in a way, too, though, something can never change. And if you look at that middle picture, that's uh, Pui, where the Royal uh, Regiment of Canada landed on August 19th. You can see very little has changed um, uh, off the grizzly picture. But when you're standing there and you're looking at that photo, you're aware that uh, some things don't really change. But um, landscape there has changed, and it's always a challenge of what challenge to try to recreate or try to imagine what's happened. A big part of its development, and this is a, a, a picture looking back from Barrier Ridge. I see Rob nodding there; he remembers being there in, in July. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see that housing development that wasn't there. Oh, 12 years ago, and I don't know if it's going to keep encroaching, but you're starting to see this in more and more areas. We get annoyed that they want to, uh, the French and Belgians want to build and move forward and mess up uh, our Canadian battle sites, but uh, progress, it's amazing how much has been retained, but it, it is creeping, and uh, just in the last uh, even five years, I've noticed some changes in some of the little towns and villages now having suburb development sprawling onto what were battle sites. Um, you saw just a couple of years ago, the, a lot of uh, media 
uh, excitement over building condos around the Juno Beach Center, you can see that that was a real uh, spark for people. Uh, but that's going on all over Northwest Europe and not just in around Juno. So hopefully that type of um, passion <laughs> Uh, comes forth when they start to build on other other areas. One thing that doesn't change the iron harvest. Um, some of you who've been on different trips, we you know you come across this stuff all the time. Bottom right, a few years back, uh, there's a shell that just came came up. I was looking at uh, on a road that we were supposed to drive down. We didn't drive down it. Um, but it's not uncommon as anyone who goes over there to see shells and grenades and other ordnance laying around. Um, even on, but I, there's, other, of course, you know, those beautiful landscapes that you see in Belgium, you're always mindful that a few feet under the surface is a darker, more grisly um, ex reality. And there's still, the missing are still there. We came across remains on one of our pilgrimages uh, about 15 years ago, 13 years ago now. Um, you know, it's bound to happen. And uh, it's a real reminder or not so much a reminder, but it's just an eye opener of what what you're walking, you're, you know, walk walk carefully in these areas. You're, you're literally walking on, on grave sites. They're just unknown. Um, so that's that's something that is going to keep reoccurring. The other thing with development too, um, there's some of you who on past experience pilgrimages we went to the Canal of the Nord, and again, probably Canada's most uh, um, complex and maybe perhaps arguably the greatest battle of the, of the Great War for Canada, and yet really nothing there to designate it. And now with uh, the French needing um, an alternate to their A1 highway for commercial traffic. They're talking about, well, they're not talking, they are doing now is making a, a grand canal. They're going to cut right through that battle area and it will change the landscape forever. And uh, remains and other iron harvest will certainly come, come out and we'll start seeing a lot more um, remains being brought brought out from that area but it will change the battlefield and touring that area of course for good and of course the last lastly when I just talk about changing times um, I mentioned I started doing this you could go to sites uh, like Bowman Hamel for example or the Newfoundlanders where you would see all sorts of things laying around the fields that were left over those are all gone uh, people have picked those over in the last uh, 25 years or so. Um, you're getting more and more bigger tours going over uh, with the Band of Brothers movie uh, 20 or series 20 years ago. Big interest from Americans coming over. You can see, uh, and my apologies to our American cousins, but they have a whole fleets of these giant uh, luxury um coaches that will descend on on sites through Normandy and um, um, it, it just really changing how how I guess what might have been quiet and simple and meaningful can become very tourist orientated much like perhaps it was in the 20s back in the original battlefield tours and so there's this there's always this sort of um, a tension between the pilgrim and the tourist and those going for wow factors and because they saw it on TV and those who want to go because they feel it in the heart and uh, hopefully hopefully it uh, leads to more people going and being moved and feeling it in the heart and I point out too the guy on the bottom left was also a tourist at Vimy so <laughs> Hitler there but uh, you know People have been touring that site uh, since it was uh, erected in 1936. And lastly, just in closing, you know, my association with the pilgrimage was kind of by fluke. I got in, never intend, never knew what a tour guide did. Had to kind of got in the back door, but it's been an absolute labor of love over the years. Uh, I just really get a thrill out of watching and, and watching people experience these sites. 
and finding meaning and then hearing about what they do with it when they get home later. Um, I did it originally as a, just a way of um, saying thank you uh, to veterans. It was such a lopsided, really a lopsided debt, but uh, it was a little thing that I could do to say, give back and, and say thank you. And now it's, it's now their grandchildren and great grandchildren and trying to preserve their memory and remembrance, uh, hopefully moving forward. I think with the pilgrimage under the National Foundation, we're in good shape and we're looking uh, new opportunities. And so not just the national program, but expanding other uh, National Foundation type tours as well. And so more opportunities for Canadians uh, associated with the Legion or not to go over to Europe and experience and walk in their footsteps. And that is, that's the end. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so if you could just start, John, by not sharing your slideshow or Tom help him do that or whatever, so we can get that moved off. Uh, secondly, uh, I will just explain to you that normally we'd have seen John through this entire presentation, but unfortunately, because of some issues in relation to his, in, his, his internet, John has yeah. been speaking to you over his phone. Uh, at, basically you need so he's been on his phone the whole time otherwise normally we would have seen his little face in the corner there for the whole time but now that he's up what you're going to do is you will see him but he will be talking from his phone all other things being equal this should all still work um and so what's going to happen now is uh, first of all thank you john we'll do a formal thank you towards the end but basically now it's just a matter of finding your finding your little uh, chat hand uh, so you go to the top right hand corner of your screen normally, you'll see a box that says more, and that should, you tap that, you should be able to see a raise hand at the bottom of that, and you just tap on that if you'd like to ask a question, and then uh, we capture you and away we go. So that's the, that's the actual plan. Uh, and so um, uh, I'm just looking through the uh, large numbers that we have online, and let me say we have quite a few. Uh, uh, well over, I think, my, I think well over 50 online here. So I'm, so, so I'm just looking for some little hands. Uh, yeah, uh, so yes, I'm giving uh, people, yes. so, uh, and uh, basically mute yourselves yeah. until such time as we actually need you. And then we'll, we'll grab you up and let you unmute. So I'm still looking through. Um, uh, I do have a comment in from the. Uh, uh, I'm not interested. I've said this before you guys, bye. Oh, I'm not sure what that's all about. <laughs> Okay, I'm not sure what that what happened just happened there, but let me start, John, by saying that um, uh, I, 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 having been to Beaumont Hamill and uh, Vimy as part of a staff college pilgrimage, uh, I can understand this idea of some things hit you more emotionally than not than others, and certainly Beaumont Hamill for me was a significant moment. That's quite an extraordinary place to go. It's quite a, I mean, it's just a small, but what happened there is so extraordinary and so bad. Uh, and I remember that, and I certainly remember that feeling, and I remember today. So I really, when you said those comments, I think that's really indicative of, of what that you're absolutely right. One of them will really get to you. One of them will have more meaning for you than you could even imagine until you get there. So I, I think that, that that is a significant thing that does happen when you do, do these things. So um, I'm going to just look and see. Uh, there are obviously there have been other people on, on the group, group here who have, in fact, been on one of these pilgrimages with you. <laughs> so, and somebody obviously is coughing. Uh, so, um, uh, again, I encourage you to put up a hand if you have some questions for John or we won't be doing questions. OK, so, Ed, I'm going to start with Ed Fewer here. I noticed, Ed, you take yourself on mute, off mute and away you go. You're free to ask. OK, good evening. Um... I was a little hesitant to put up the video because I'm sitting here in my PJs watching the hockey game and listen to the program. <laughs> well, um, you, you, can, you don't have to do video if you don't want to. Don't well, it's there. what the heck. I'm a new planner. I don't have much shame. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I first met John back in 2007. I went on the, uh, the his pilgrimage, and I went on it actually four times. It was that impactful. And I went as a paying pilgrim. I, I, no freebie for me. I went on my own. And I've been going back ever since. And as John, who got me, convinced me that I needed to go back, uh, and just just to try and understand, it was it was just I couldn't sleep for six months. Come you know, once we got home, and I've been going back every year since. And uh, I've now, my last November was my thirty third trip over there. So 
Uh, I got three more planned for this year. So uh, uh, it, it's, you know, it's something you got, you got to see it to believe it. Uh, the shock and awe, it only happens the first time. It, it, it never replicates itself when you go back, but it's always still impactful. Like, see, Beaumont Hamlin, you mentioned that, because my great uncle was killed there on July 1st as part, of, as part of the Newfoundland Regiment. Thankfully, he has an own grave, so I'm able to go visit him every time I go over. But it was John's inspiration and John's uh, words and uh, uh, that just, you know, just drilled into me the importance of, of, of getting it. Now, I'm fortunate to be able to do it as often as I have. Um, but I I never get tired of it. And the day that comes, and I guess that day will come at some point where I won't be able to go back for whatever reason, uh, that's not going to be a happy time for me. But, I mean, you know, the, the thing about it is the battlefields, the, you know, the orientations that you do, none of it is as impactful as walking the roads in a war cemetery. You look at the names, you look at the ages, and that's what first got me was the ages of, of, of the, uh, some of the fallen. And I unconsciously first started putting flags on the graves of Canadian teenagers. Uh, I didn't notice that several years later when I caught myself doing it. I said, oh, my God, I've been doing this for a while. But it's just, you, you know, you try to imagine what you were doing when you were 15, 16 years old. And you're wondering, my God, what in the name of hell was, was this guy doing here at that age? Uh, and and it's, it's just incredible. I mean, the price that was paid is in blood. And that blood is buried in the fields of, of Flanders and, 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 not just, and not just Western Europe, but all over the world. Um, and it's really a, a place that I'm, I'm truly at peace with myself is in the cemeteries and it might sound a bit strange in some ways, but it really is true. And it all started with John. I mean, myself and John became good friends ever since. I mean, we talk almost every month on the phone and whatnot. Uh, so, uh, you know, John, thanks very much for this. Uh, just, just uh, reminded me of all the, all the places that I went with you on your tour for the four trips that I did do with you. And, uh, Again, thank you so much for being a, an inspiration for me to continue doing what I do. Yeah, that's very nice of you to say. Ed, Ed's been there more times than I have, and there's not a guy that knows more about, uh, you know, especially Newfoundlanders, but the Great War. Uh, he, we should get him as a as a guest uh, in an upcoming presentation. Oh. He's got to tell you. Okay, well, Ed, thank you very much for sharing, and we will keep that in mind. You never <laughs> just, just you wait and see. I've now got yep. Kyle Scott has got his hand raised, so I'm going to move on to Kyle and let Kyle have an opportunity to un unmute, and away we go. And then, uh, Kyle, if you'd like to proceed, you have to unmute yourself, and there you go. You're off and running. Hello. Hello. Hey, Kyle. <laughs> hey, good to hear. See ya. Yeah, it's good to see you too, John. It's uh, It's been a while. Um, I was a command pilgrim. I represented uh, Alberta Northwest Territory uh, Command in 2019, right before the end of things for a while. Um, and uh, as admittedly, I was a bit on the younger side, I guess, of of everyone on the trip. Um, it wasn't my first experience uh, in traveling Europe and seeing um, the battlefields. I, I had... Uh, <clears throat> I'd gotten out of the army not too many years before that, and um, it was a dream of mine as a as a as a child to travel over and see where my grandfather and my great grandfather and everyone else had fought and served. So my father and I had booked a trip, as as we do as men, we don't plan things very well. <laughs> we we click on the first thing we find that that meets our need, and away we go. So we booked a trip over and. And uh, this was in 2009, and uh, and it was great. Don't get me wrong. We we toured. We saw the places. We went to the, some of the battlefields, but it was very, um, it was very commercialized. And I didn't realize that until I got to head over in 2019. And the thing that John does so well, and that the pilgrimage is so different from when you book one of these larger tours, as John showed some of the the coaches there that you see. Um, John puts so much more effort and work into telling the story and to taking it to a personal level. Um, you know, I, 
some of us are far more nerdy about this stuff than we probably should be, but um, you know, we we take pride in in knowing the the finer details of things. And when you you know hang a left at a farmer's mailbox and you go up to the third oak tree and jump over the fence post and there you are, and that's exactly where some veteran's personal diary says his machine gun position was and that's exactly where you can see the shell casings to this day and you can see it's it's so much more personal to to think of it on an individual level rather than the overall hollywood aspect of of this is vimy ridge or this is passchendaele or this is you go to the monument you go to the war memorial it's it was so much bigger than that and those fine little details um I can fully admit, as the John was uh, speaking earlier, we'd we'd gone to the um, the site of one of the atrocities, and um, you know, I always like to think I have a fairly thick skin when it comes to this stuff, but I completely broke down um, on that site hearing that I never knew the story. We've all heard of the Abbey Arden, but these other atrocities that happened often within visual range of the Abbey you know, no idea, no idea. And hearing that story and it just struck so deeply, uh, I completely broke down, which it might sound weird to some, it was kind of refreshing at the same time because I thought I'd forgotten how to do that. But um, it, it, uh, it was deeply emotional and that trip with all of those pilgrims and especially with John was highly impactful and um if if there's anybody here who has not been i i cannot say enough that you need to experience it and very much so with uh john leading the way uh, as opposed to some of the other places you can go but um uh i've said it before but i'll say it again thanks for everything you do john it was it was highly emotional for me and it was um, impactful and I am grateful for that experience. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Kyle. Well, thank you, Kyle, for sharing that. It, it is appreciated. I'm going to move on to Paul Robs Robinson now. Paul, you're next up. For, for So far, we've had testimonials. We haven't actually had any questions there. <laughs> there, John. <laughs> oh, okay, Paul, it's yours. You could just unmute yourself. There you go. I think I've done that. All right. Um, I have a question at the end. Um, tribute first. I had the incredible privilege of going last year. And uh, I, just kudos and hats off to John. You mentioned that uh, we won't always remember all the details, but we will remember how we felt. And I just want to say that I think what John presents is, is the feeling, because he feels it. And that was so very touching and, and deeply impactful to me. Um, one question that came up while we were there, and I don't know how this would be done, is John, has there been any thought to capturing your presentation or presentations? I don't know how many programs that would take for a film board or somebody else to produce <laughs> that, but um, you have so much to share, and I'm just wondering if that's being captured on screen anywhere. That's my question, and thanks very, very much for all that you've done. Well, thank you, Paul. Good to see you again. Um, I think moving forward uh, with the National Foundation, there is movement to get into this century with technology and recording. Uh, I think on the next tour, they were talking about actually uh, having a, whatever a cinematographer is called now, <laughs> going along. Um, on any particular tour, I think uh, the last one, there was 90 three or four different specific uh, orientations that we did. But um, I'm open to it. And I know that uh, they're looking at uh, how the, how they present and how they promote the pilgrimage and, and featuring it is, is moving forward technologically speaking as well. So Paul, I think that would be a good thing also to let them know your thoughts uh, if that's um, put a bug in their ear. I'll certainly you're speak for it. Yeah, you're speaking from experience to someone that was there, so I think they would be they would listen. Well, I don't see any other questions in the in the hopper here, John. So I'm gonna stop now. But before I do, I just want to comment that last month in the War Museum, we had a friends forum that we were unable to take. 
And it was Norm Christie speaking about the 44 Canadians who have gone missing from their graves at Vimy. There were at, at what was called CP40. But in the, what was the one of the amazing parts of his presentation, along with the fact that we found out about this issue and how it has raised itself several times, was he gave an incredible lecture on how these graveyards are all established and staked out and how the graves are managed from the time of the battle through to when they're finally put in the larger grave sites. And I really regretted that we were not able to record it simply because we didn't have at the time uh, someone around to do it. And we could never, so I'm really hoping that the next time he gives this presentation somewhere, we will we, uh, try to make sure that he is recorded. And if he is recorded by someone that we get a copy of that and then can have it so that we can let this membership, including those who come online today, to see it online, say at YouTube, so they can see this presentation that Norm Christie gives, because then it only adds to an understanding of what happened, how these grave sites came to be and where the grave sites were initially. It's in a great baseline, sort of a, a, a one on one of, of these graves, a really good one on one done by Norm Christie, who can do it in a light, pleasant, you know, sort of interesting manner for Canadians. So I'm just putting that out there that if we're able to ever grab that presentation in some manner, we're going to try to grab it and get it, make sure that we can get it out to the membership, because I think it will only add to you. It's going to have the lot when you go for these one on ones, which are wonderful, which I is just it gives a little context behind the background and how this these large how, you know, we have names now on the Vimy Memorial that said they're missing when in fact these bodies were never missing. The families were given letters and told exactly where they were right after that battle. So they're not missing, and yet they're on the Vimy Memorial is missing. So it's an interesting, it's just another interesting piece of this puzzle that we don't want to see lost in the fullness of time. And it fed very nicely for those of us did get to see it to, on then coming into a presentation of something like yours, which is on a more sort of one on one level. So thank you very much for coming to do this. Thank you. Um, and really thank you for letting us record you tonight. So we will <laughs> post it. We will post it for our membership for the broader community, should they wish to see it. Uh, we will be giving you a thank you gift of a gift certificate to our bookstore for the next time you come into town. And uh, if you want, if, if you find you're not coming into town, you can always re-gift it, but we will be giving you a little gift certificate to say thank you. I'll send it by email to you. And I would also then finally close with just a comment that we are going to have a presentation in April, which will be a combined in the museum and recorded, uh, I think hopefully virtual, actually delivered online at the same time. Uh, and it will be on a, it's the Second World War, it's on a battle that, that are a, a, a relationship between the Poles and, and Canadian artillery, and they work together, and they, there were a number of these Canadians that were highly decorated by the Polish military, Polish, just after the battles, and we want to make sure that this story doesn't get lost in the, in the annals of history. So we're going to try to drag, drag this story into the museum. It's, it's also tied to the anniversary dates. I think it's the 80th anniversary of those battles. So we're going to try to bring it into the museum next month. And then, uh, so, and so we keep moving forward on these friends forums. And so I thank you people, those of you that come online for the first time with us, uh, just uh, please be aware that we are going to try to distribute the, through the um, Legion, for instance, we're going to try to distribute our our, news, our, our our posters about these events. And the same thing for those who come in via the museum route, the Canadian War Museum's um, members, we also are going to try to get it out through that route as well. So that we don't just go to our own friends, friends uh, distribution list, but we're broader going forward for those that are interested. So on that basis, again, John, thank you very much for coming online. Thank you, the rest of you, for being with us tonight. And I hope you found it um, interesting enough to come back again and visit us. Oh, Scott, I see one more question out there. Scott Healy's hand that just appeared up. He's the vice president of Friends. And I see his little paw up. So I'm going to just let Scott have the final last remarks. Jo Scott, no, it's yours. No, Louise, no, I, I was trying to put up a thumbs up to a very <laughs> good presentation. And okay. the hand went up. But uh, okay. <laughs> you uh, did a great job, Louise. And... Uh, Certainly, John, that was a fantastic demo, uh, you know, uh, presentation right across the board. And I would like to thank all of those, as Louise has mentioned, who helped distribute and pass the word along about these Friends Forums. And I think our, uh, our attendance is, is growing. And uh, we at the Friends, and in particular, Louise, who uh, manages the Friends Forum, really appreciate it. So as we get these notices out, that's my responsibility with my team to get the notices out. You distribute them as you see fit. So if you think there's more people that may be interested, just, you know, just pass it along. More people, the better. We'd be very, very happy to uh, 
add uh, people to this. So anyways, thanks very much, John. And thank you, Louise, for the wonderful job you did. And especially thank you to John who managed to troubleshoot his way to, so we could actually hear him tonight. Thank you, John.